Brothers and sisters in Lord Jesus Christ, our, our Lord's Day for this Sunday afternoon is Lord's Day 8 of the Heidelberg Catechism, one of the confessional documents of this church. Lord's Day 8, question answer 24, asks the following question, how are these articles divided? And the articles in question are the articles of the Apostles' Creed. How are these articles divided? And the answer is into three parts. The first is about God the Father and our creation. The second is about God the Son and our redemption. And the third about God the Holy Spirit and our sanctification. The second question then is, since there is only one God, why do you speak of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And the answer is, because God has so revealed himself in his word that these three distinct persons are the one true eternal God. That's Lord's Day 8 of the, of the Heidelberg Catechism. And rather than jump directly into Lord's Day 8, what I'd like to do is I would like to sort of take the scenic route there. We're going to get to Lord's Day 8, but we're going to take the scenic route. I don't know how many of you like to go out for a drive or if you've got a destination in mind and you like to take the scenic route there so that you can see all the interesting stuff on the way. I like taking the scenic route. I don't know if anybody else likes taking the scenic route. I find there are two different kinds of people in the world. Those who like the scenic route and those who go crazy when someone takes the scenic route because it's not particularly efficient. And so that's true of my wife and I. My wife's name is Berber and she hates it when I take the scenic route. She likes to go somewhere directly, efficiently. She always knows what lane you have to be in and whether you should turn at the advanced green or go straight. She always has it all laid out. And unfortunately, she's married to somebody who likes to take the scenic route. And I think she still prays for my sanctification and that, that I would get to the stage where I would have driving efficiency rather than take the scenic route. I think that it's, it's scenic route is good. However, I, I do understand her point, and I think that taking the most direct and efficient route is also an attractive quality in a preacher. That's what they teach you in seminary, for instance. When you're going to introduce a sermon, you should be efficient, and you shouldn't spend too much time driving around everywhere before you get to your point, a bit like I'm doing in this introduction. They tell you not to have introductions like that. Well, we're going to do something different today. We're not going to listen to the seminary professor, and we're going to say we're going to get to Lord's Day 8, but we're going to take the scenic route a little bit on the way there, and we're going to see some interesting things. And I promise you it's going to be worth it, because when you get to the destination, you're going to enjoy it more. So, Lord's Day 8. Come along for the ride. I want to take the scenic route there, and we're going to start looking at Lord's Day 8, or our drive toward Lord's Day 8 by talking about Berber. Not Berber, my wife, but about the Berber people of North Africa. So the Berber people are an ethnicity, or a, a people group of North Africa. They're called the Berber people. I've had the chance to meet some Berber people when I was working in West Africa. And they produce the famous Berber carpets that you might know of. And that's a carpet-making practice that goes back thousands of years in North Africa. Today, if you go to North Africa, 99.9% uh, .9 of Berber people are Muslim. But at one point in time, the Berber ethnic group, the Berber people of North Africa, produced Christianity's greatest and most famous thinkers. In, early, in the early church, the, the greatest Christian thinkers came from the Berber people group of North Africa. So... In the, you know, the first couple of hundred years after Christianity, North Africa was part of the Roman Empire, and uh, a lot of that area in North Africa became Christian. And so all of these, these really important, famous North African Berber people thinkers come from, from that area. For instance, Augustine or Augustine, uh, you know, a very famous church theologian and father of the church, uh, speaking writing in the, in the late 300s, was born in Algeria, and he was of Berber origin. And if you go to 200 years, around 200 years after Jesus Christ, you can think of Cyprian, who was born in Tunisia, and he's a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. He was a martyr, and he was born of the Berber people group. And then of particular interest for me today, as we do our scenic route to Lord's Day 8, is Tertullian. Uh, in the, the late 100s, early 200s after Jesus, also born in Tunisia, and he was also a Berber. He was, he was from the Berber people group. And Tertullian was the first Christian theologian to use the word Trinity. The first Christian uh, theologian to use the word Trinitas, Trinity. 
And he used that word, he kind of made up that word to talk about the fact that we believe in one God, in three persons. So the word Trinity comes to us from an early African theologian of the Berber ethnic group. That's where the word comes from. Which means if you're married to a woman named Berber, you're super blessed. So now you're sort of, some of you are already thinking, enough of the scenic drive already, get us to Lord's Day 8. Don't be a backseat driver. We're going to get there. It's going to be worth it. Be patient. We're getting there. Tertullian, uh, he's writing in, he, he writes something interesting. About 204 after the, the, the birth of Christ, so not, you know, about 100 years after the end of the Old Testament, Tertullian, uh, he writes something very interesting. He, he says in one of his writings that there is an ancient Christian tradition. So he's only writing 200 years after Jesus, and he, and he says there's an ancient Christian tradition. And that ancient Christian tradition is to make the sign of the cross. Like so. That's how you do it if you're Roman Catholic. If you're Eastern Orthodox, you go like this, and you go to this shoulder first, and you go like this. But Tertullian, in 204 after Christ, says that doing this is an ancient Christian tradition. Probably coming from the first hundred years after Jesus, perhaps also present at the end of the New Testament era. And what is that? It's the sign of the cross. It's the sign of the cross of Christ. It's making a cross upon yourself in prayer. And it's not just a sign of the cross, but it also corresponds with the, the names of the, our triune God. So when, when people cross themselves, they say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So they make the sign of the cross of Jesus, but they label it with the words of the triune God. And so according to Tertullian, this, this early Christian thinker, pastor of Berber ethnic uh, origin, he says this is an ancient Christian practice. Early Christians did this very, very early on. They made the sign of the cross, the sign of the Trinity, on their bodies in prayer. And so you could easily recognize someone, uh, you know, if, if they were praying and they did this, well, then you knew that they were Christian. They marked their body with the cross of Christ and with the triune God. At the time of the Reformation, um, Martin Luther was totally okay with continuing that practice. And so Lutherans today will still cross themselves. You'll see that. Martin Luther didn't have a problem with that. John Calvin, he didn't think that there was anything wrong with making the sign of the cross per se. But he saw that it was, at his time, um, it was caught up in all kinds of superstition and tradition. So if you would have gone to Roman Catholic Mass at the time of, of Calvin, at the time of the Reformation, some, in some Masses, you would have to make the sign of the cross like 40 times. And people started using it to sort of ward off evil spirits, like make the sign of the cross. And they had superstitions connected to that. So John Calvin was like, enough of that. Let's just throw that out. We don't need to be engaged in any of that superstition. But the reformers didn't think that it was sinful or anything or, or necessarily wrong. And they recognized that making the sign of the cross was an ancient Christian tradition. So we don't, we don't use the sign of the cross as Protestants. I don't know of any of you if you've ever even ever done that in your whole life. And you probably aren't going to start anytime soon. We don't, we don't make the sign of the cross. You don't find that in any of our services except for in one place. There's one place. So, I don't know if you have a book of praise with you. You could look it up with me. But in, in, in the book of praise, we have hymn 57. The hymn is called We Praise You, Lord. It's a baptism hymn. And uh, it refers to the sign of the cross. So, in hymn 57, the first verse is, We praise you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, who died and rose again. He lives, he broke the power of sin, and over death now reigns. Now, listen to the second verse. We praise you, Lord, that this dear child is grafted to the vine, and as a member of your house, now bears the cross as sign. So we sing that at baptisms. So in, in 2010, the Standing Committee for the Book of Praise recommended to our Canadian Reform Synod of that year that we do not include that hymn. Because, they said, um, amongst other things, they said, baptism is not the sign of the cross. It's the sign of God's promises. And so the hymn says that the child bears the cross as sign, that is not good theology. And Synod decided to include it in anyways, which I'm really happy they did. Because the Standing Committee for the Book of Praise sort of misunderstood what the hymn was saying. So the hymn is, is written by Judith O'Neill. She was a Roman Catholic. And if you go to a Roman Catholic baptism, 
you can imagine, you know, you get some water and then they, they pour it on the baby's head. And then what they do is, as they pour it on the baby's head, they make the sign of the cross. Or perhaps even with the water, make the sign of the cross with their hand on the baby's forehead. And so at baptism, the baby literally, as you put water on them, bears the sign of the cross on their forehead as they're baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so if you go to a Lutheran church, for instance, at my church in, in Ottawa, we rent our building from a Lutheran church, and if you were to attend a Lutheran baptism, they would do the same thing. They would make the sign of the cross on the child as they baptize the child, remembering that their baptism is in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God. And so that's why it's, uh, it's in hymn 57, and I think it, it makes good historical sense. After all, Tertullian said that it was an ancient Christian practice to make the sign of the cross. All right, so we're on, we're on our scenic drive to Lord's Day 8, right? So what have, we, what have we seen so far? Well, we've seen that the word Trinity is used to describe the one true God in three persons, and that, that word comes to us from very early Christianity, and that at that time of early Christianity, people made the sign of the cross, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as a physical sign as part of the early Christian tradition, and that although we don't practice or we don't continue that practice ourselves today, we do acknowledge the practice in hymn 57 of our book of praise as we baptize our own children into the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, that's the scenic route. Now we're at Lord's Day 8. All right, now we're at Lord's Day 8. And what do we find? We find that the, Holy, that the Heidelberg Catechism teaches that the Apostles' Creed, which Lord's Day 7 tells us is the summary of the gospel, the gospel promises, the summary of what all Christians must believe, and that the Heidelberg Catechism teaches us that this creed, this ancient creed that summarizes Christian uh, gospel is organized according to the, to, to the lines, uh, according to the, the, the Trinity. It's according to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that you can look at the whole creed, the Apostles' Creed, and you recognize that first of all, it speaks about God the Father and our creation. And second of all, it speaks about God the Son and our redemption. And thirdly, the creed talks about the Holy Spirit and our sanctification. And the reason that I'm making the sign as I speak to you is to drive home the following important point, that what we have here in the Heidelberg Catechism is not some sort of new and unique thinking that came to us in the time of the Reformation. This is not peculiar just to the Reformation or just to, re to Reformed people. What we have here in, in Lord's Day 8 is the faithful passing down to us the ancient Christian faith of the Holy Catholic Church. Lord's Day is faithfully passing down to us the ancient Christian faith of the Holy Catholic Church since the beginning of, since the, uh, the, beginning of the church, from, from Jerusalem to Burlington, from Tunisia to Ebenezer, from Berber theologians in North Africa to my wife Berber and all of you. Lord's Day 8 is driving home the very important truth that the promises of the gospel, the content of the true Christian faith, is Trinitarian. It's Trinitarian. To be a Christian is to be Trinitarian. Whether you mark that on yourself as you speak about it or not, to be a Christian is to be Trinitarian. Now, we Christians, like Jews and Muslims, we often call ourselves monotheists which means we believe in one God, monotheists. And that's true, but what really sets us apart from Jews and from Muslims is that we are Trinitarians. We believe in one God, but one God in three persons. And to be a Christian, to be a Christian is to, in baptism, bear the sign of the cross. It, it is to, in baptism, bear the name and to be baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's to grow up and to believe in the promises of the gospel, which can be summarized as first, God the Father in our creation, God the Son in our redemption, and God the Holy Spirit in our sanctification. This is what it means to be a Christian. And so thank you, Lord's Day 8, for reminding us of the, the essence the fundamental, very basic Christian idea that to be a Christian is to believe in the Trinity. You can't overestimate how important that is. 
The Dutch theologian Herman Bavink says it this way, in the doctrine of the Trinity beats the heart of the whole revelation of God for the redemption of humanity. In the doctrine of the Trinity beats the heart of the whole revelation of God for the redemption of humanity. Everything about the Bible, everything about salvation is found in the doctrine of the Trinity. And so we, we sing in the creed today, Sunday after Sunday, we, we sing along with the holy Catholic Christian church of all ages and all places, and we say, I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. We start with God the Father. 1 Corinthians 8, 5 through 6 says, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. God the Father, the creator of all things, the powerful, the almighty, the eternal God who spoke the universe into being and who upholds and governs the entire world by his eternal counsel and providence. He is your creator. Each one of you here today, no matter how old you are, were knit together in your mother's womb by God the Father, making you in his image, and he gives us breath, and he gives us beating hearts. And he gives us a place and a time to live in. And he upholds all of these things. So nothing comes to us by chance. But everything comes to us in the fatherly hand of God. And we can confess that God is our father. Why? Well, because of God the Son in our redemption. And so the, the Apostles' Creed moves from the Father to the Son. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son. Colossians 1 Verse 15 and 19 describes Jesus as the image of the invisible God. For in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Hebrews 1 verse 3 describes Jesus as the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And Jesus himself says, anybody who has seen me has seen the Father in John 14. Jesus is a distinct person, but he is the one true eternal God along with the Father. Romans 11.36 says, For him and through him and to him are all, thing, all things were made. In other words, Jesus had a role also in creation. God the Father spoke words in Genesis 1 to God the Son, and through him the creation came into being. But Jesus is more specifically associated with God the Son and our redemption, as the Catechism teaches us. There are redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. Colossians 1 through Christ, uh, through Jesus, God is reconciling to himself all things, whether on heaven or on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The cross is where the Son comes to redeem us, to destroy the work of the devil, to reconcile us to the Father. God the Father in our creation, God the Son in our redemption, and then God the Holy Spirit in our sanctification. And so in the creed, Sunday after Sunday, we confess, I believe in God the Father, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is not just a force or an extension of the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is a distinct person, and yet he is God along with the Father and the Son, the one true eternal God. A good, a good a proof text for that comes to us in Acts 5 where Ananias lies to the Holy Spirit, and then in the next verse it says he lied to God. And God the Holy Spirit, we know, is also involved in creation. It's the Spirit of God that hovers over the waters in Genesis 1. And every spring we see the Holy Spirit's work as he causes trees to come to bud and the flourishing of creation. And of course the Holy Spirit is also active in our redemption along with the Son in regenerating our hearts so that we believe making a share in all the benefits of Christ, but his specific role, according to the creed, is in our sanctification. And sanctification is a big word that means set apart, set apart to be holy, consecrated to, to a special task or a special something. So in John 17, Jesus says, I consecrate myself that they also might be sanctified. I devote myself to holy service, that they might also do the same. And so that's what holiness is all about. The Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts, and he sanctifies us, he sets us apart, and he makes us who the Father has created and who the Son has redeemed, and he makes us devoted to loving the Lord our God and loving our neighbor. He sets us apart for that task. 
And so you can see how God the Father in our creation and God the Son in our redemption and God the Holy Spirit in our sanctification covers all of the bases. So Herman Bavinck says it this way, in the doctrine of the Trinity beats the heart of the whole revelation of God for the redemption of humanity. It's all contained in the Trinity. It's all contained in the Trinity. And then what this the whole, what the Heidelberg Catechism does is it takes this ancient Trinitarian confession, this ancient Trinitarian truth that has been passed down to us through, from Scripture throughout history, clarified by Tertullian and really clarified by Athanasius, who wrote the Athanasian Creed, another African theologian. And the Heidelberg Catechism will now spend 12 Lord's Days explaining the Apostles' Creed. Twelve Lord's Days explaining the Apostles' Creed, explaining the Trinitarian faith, because that's what it's all about. That's what it means to be a Christian. And then it'll get to Lord's Day 23, and it'll ask, so what does it help you now that you believe all this? What does it help you? To believe in all the promises of the gospel summarized in the Apostles' Creed. What does it help you at the end of the day to believe in God the Father in your creation, God the Father in our redemption, and God the Holy Spirit in our sanctification? What does it help you to believe all of that? And the answer is, in Christ, I am righteous before God, and I am heir to life everlasting. Christ has made you and me, Christ has made us children of the Father above, who created and cares for us. He's made us brothers and sisters and servants of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has redeemed us. He's made us temples and instruments of the Holy Spirit, who fills us up and sanctifies us and makes us holy. This is Christianity. This is the Holy Catholic Christian faith. That's what it's all about. We are Trinitarian. So, all of you kids, raise your hand if you were baptized. You don't remember it, do you? Yeah, you were, you were all baptized, and we could ask the adults, and I think most of the adults here would say, yeah, I've been baptized as well. So this is, this is what that means. If you were baptized, all of you, that means that you bear the sign of the cross. To be baptized means you bear the sign of the cross. You can't see it. You can't like look really hard in the mirror and see if you can see like a sign of a cross on your forehead. It doesn't work like that. But your soul bears the sign of the cross. You've been baptized into the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit and His promises have marked you as a covenant child. You have been, you bear the sign of the cross. You've been marked with the triune God's promises, His covenant promises. And that sign, that sign of the cross, which you bear by virtue of your baptism, calls you to respond to it. It calls you to respond how? Well, you can think of it this way. In baptism, we're marked by the sign of the cross in baptism. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And to respond in faith is to say, I believe in God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. You're baptized and given the sign of the cross and you respond by making the sign of the cross in faith. Not, of course, just physically. I'm not trying to convince you that you all need to start going like this now. But by faith, faithfully professing along with the church of all ages and places that yes, indeed, I do believe in God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father, my Creator, and God the Son, my Redeemer, and God the Holy Spirit, my Sanctifier. In baptism, I was given the sign of the cross, the sign of the Trinitarian promises of God. And when I profess my faith, all I do is I trace the sign that God marked me with. In your baptism, you are marked with the sign of the triune God, marked with the cross. And your faith is simply to respond, saying yes to those promises, and trace the promises that God gave you in faith, the Trinitarian promises of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Isn't that beautiful? I love how this Lord's Day just, just takes the Christian faith and makes it all so beautifully simple and wondrous and deep. A good way to remind you of the, uh, yourself of these kind of things is to make sure that your prayers are Trinitarian. I'm struck by, by the fact that if you look in the back of the book of praise, you, we've got a list of prayers. Those are good prayers to use in your family or use at various times in your life. And, and if you read those, you, you will be struck at how many of those prayers are distinctly Trinitarian in nature. 
Listen to this. The, the prayer before baptism ends with, All this we ask through him, our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit, one only God, lives and reigns forever. The prayer after baptism. May he or she forever praise and magnify you and your Son, Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Spirit, the one true God. The prayer after the Lord's Supper. To you, Father, be all glory, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The prayer after the ordination of ministers. Hear, O Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit, one only God, lives and reigns forever. The prayer after the solemnization of marriage. Hear us, merciful Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit, the one only true God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. Our spiritual forefathers, our Reformed forefathers, who wrote these forms and wrote these prayers, were doing their best to be distinctly Trinitarian also in their prayers, and I think we should follow their example. That's a good way to remind yourself that you are indeed Trinitarian, to in, sort of get that deeply rooted in your soul and in your Christian practice. We also have to make sure that that continues to flow into the songs that we sing. After all, most of the songs that we sing in church are prayers, aren't they? When we're singing, we're, we're often praying. And so all of the hymns that we're, we're singing in this service, you will notice, are distinctly Trinitarian songs, Trinitarian hymns. And the church needs to sing songs about God the Father and our creation. And it needs to sing songs about God the Son and our redemption. And it needs to sing songs about God the Holy Spirit and our sanctification. Not every song needs to mention all three. But generally, we want our prayers and our songs to be Trinitarian in nature. And that's why it's also important to remember that we, we don't only sing psalms in church. We also sing hymns. And I absolutely love the psalms, and I will defend their place in worship and the need to make sure that we continue to sing them. And I understand also that the Holy Spirit and God the Father is mentioned explicitly in the psalms, and that Jesus Christ is also foreshadowed in many, many psalms. Of course, He is. But given the centrality of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as our triune God, that we're not only monotheists, but also Trinitarians, Trinitarian believers, we ought to sing also explicitly of our triune God in our hymns. Pray Trinitarian prayers, sing Trinitarian hymns. And then I pray that that would also then embolden us and instruct us in our Christian witness to monotheistic religions that are not Trinitarian. John of Damascus was a Christian author in the, the 600s, in early 700s after Jesus. And he writes something called his critique on Islam. His critique on Islam. And in his critique on Islam, he explains the origins of Islam, and he says it this way. From that time to the present, a false prophet named Muhammad has appeared in their midst. This man, having chanced upon the Old and New Testaments, and likewise, it seems, having conversed with an Aryan monk, devised his own heresy. So, John of Damascus is saying that Muhammad starts, starts Islam by reading the Old and New Testament and then conversing with an Aryan monk. And an Aryan monk who was, would have been a follower of Arius, who was an early heretic who denied what? The Trinity. Arius was a, was a Christian heretic who denied the Trinity. And so John of Damascus is saying that the problem with Islam is that it is a heresy that denies the Trinity because it denies that Jesus Christ is God. Now here's something interesting. The Berber people of North Africa who produced the great theologians like Augustine and Cyprian and Tertullian are today in the grip of the Islamic heresy. May God be merciful and may he gather and defend and preserve his church also in North Africa and in the Middle East so that those who once in their history produced the great Trinitarian theologians of the church would one day, perhaps in also in our time, bear again the sign of the cross and the triune God. 
We took a scenic route into Lord's Day 8. Let me take a slightly scenic route out of it. Fifteen years ago, I had the, the chance to go to Rome and to visit the catacombs of Rome. And in 1599, there was a, uh, a tomb in the catacombs, a Christian tomb that was unearthed. And f- historians you know, know that the, the name of the woman who was buried in this tomb was Cecilia. And as best as f- historians can figure out, she, was, uh, she lived somewhere around the late 100s after Christ. So between, you know, 150 and 200 years after Christ. Uh, History, legends say that her husband and her brother were killed for their faith, and then she too was martyred for her faith. And they discovered this tomb and opened it, and the body was uniquely preserved, and the body was laid out in a very particular way. And in the catacombs in Rome, you can find a, a statue that that is uh, you know, carved out of marble, that shows how the body was found in the tomb. You can find the statue also in other churches in Rome. And the statue is of the woman lying down on her, on her stomach, or sort of on her shoulder, and her head is turned away, and there's a big long scar along her neck, where she was, her neck was sliced to be martyred for the faith. But what's interesting is, is that lying down in death, her hands are out over here, and her hands are going like this. She's making the sign with her hands as she dies that I believe in one God in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the faith that's worth dying for. This is the faith that's worth dying for. This is the faith, one God in three persons that we hold on to so dearly One God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.